Introducing the all-new Romeo y Julieta Passione. The story of this cigar dates back almost a year, during a visit to the Flor de Coupon factory in Honduras. We witnessed the endless amount of passion and love the workers put into each and every cigar. This hand-rolled cigar uses a blend of Dominican and Honduran filler tobaccos, along with a rich and flavorful binder from the US. The wrapper is a zesty Ecuadorian Habano leaf that offers up notes of pepper, leather, nuts, and a dash of cocoa. Ignite your passion and pick up a box of the Romeo y Julieta Passion at jrcigars.com. Get ready for Smoke Night Live with Massa Sensei. All right, ladies and gentlemen, oh, da, da, da. it's Friday, Jordan. Hey, we're back. We are back. Episode 248 Jeez. of Smoke Night Live. Thank you all for joining us. I'm your host, Master Sensei, as they call me. I'm here with my intrepid producer, Jordan. How are you doing, Jordan? Good. That's all I got We got a you. good studio audience going in the background. Yeah, yeah, you can see him there. Some of them back there. Matt, you can't see Matt, but you can see There's Scott. There's a lot of Dominic. them. We're here. And uh, here. I'm glad to be back. I was in Vegas last week for the big Hall of Fame show announcement, which was a fun show, Jordan. Oh, yeah. It's always we good. We inducted to... uh, five new members into the Dojo Hall of Fame. The best part was we didn't induct Randy. Oh, that was brutal. Oof. Randy did, however, get a uh, participation trophy. Yes. Which was good. Which no one's ever got. For Randy. He you know, I, I feel for Randy. He 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 really tried super hard. He he did oh all the right things. He made a video. He made a press a full on like a press pl- release that most cigar companies are not capable of making. No, it was like a legit press release with edited video. Yeah. He was really stumping for uh for a spot in the hall, but he didn't make it. He just didn't make it. We love Randy, but he just didn't make it. But we were out there because Kevin Acuff and Barb got married. It was a blast. We had a good time. In fact, get this, Jordan. I actually gave away the bride. You're not worthy of I that. I gave away the bride in the wedding. It was amazing. Like It was, it was incredible. They had a great ceremony. Kevin and Barb are, are amazing people. They had like, just a few friends, you know, because of the whole social distancing thing. It was in it was in Kevin's backyard, and so there was a small group, and we really had a good time. It was a blast. Drove out there, and by the way, I was saying before the show, man, my car it has this new the new cruise <laughs> control. Jordan. I didn't even the new know cruise this control. Stuff existed. It's so amazing. The cruise control just keeps you at a certain distance behind the car in front of you. So you don't even need to think, like, and it tells you if you're getting out of the lane or not. So I, I, I don't even remember driving. You like, just like kicked back. And I just kicked you back. Showed up, and I essentially, uh, I listened to podcasts and I tried to learn some Spanish. I didn't, I didn't pay attention at, at all. Like I got in my car, <laughs> and then the That's next thing enough. I knew, I was in Vegas. It was amazing. It was incredible. <laughs> I can't believe how far cars have come. It, it's summertime, Jordan. Summertime has hit us finally. It's Summertime. hot. It was hot in Vegas. Really windy though, super windy. But here in Colorado, it's hot too. And my air conditioning went out in my house. Oof! My I le- I lent you a couple of white trash air conditioners. I have the white trash old fashioned, but p- people don't know I'm also known for making a white trash air conditioner. Yeah, and Just they white trash pretty much everything. The white trash air conditioner is not as good as the white trash old fashioned. I'm going to say that. I'm okay with that. But you know what? Here's the funny part about this story is when my air conditioning in my house went out, I was, you know, I got air conditioning like 21 years ago in my house. And it was like, I think it was like $2,500, Scott. And so I'm in the garage and I told Jordan, I'm like, oh, my air conditioning went out. I mean, can you imagine what it's going to cost now? It's probably going to be like (laughs) $3,500. And Jordan was like, "Dad, no, it's it's gonna be like eight grand." I'm like, "No, it's not gonna be eight grand for an air conditioner. It's gonna be like thirty five hundred bucks. That's ridiculous. Ten grand, ten grand." See, at this point, I feel like the roles are transitioning. I'm kind of having to like guide you along. Uh, exactly. And, like, it's ridiculous. Ten grand for an air conditioner. Come the mass. They should start calling me master. What the heck? I mean, I'm totally blown away that in twenty years it would go up. 
four times the amount. But the technology, though, probably. I don't know. I don't know if there's any better technology does or something not. Something crazy. But whatever it is, it's just ridiculous. Hey, by the way, guys, thanks for joining us in the virtual lounge earlier tonight. We had Robert Caldwell in the virtual lounge, and it was really a cool uh, hour's worth of time. It was kind of, we did a little happy hour thing, and Robert Caldwell was in there. And, I mean, he was just, like, because it wasn't live, he was just, like, off the hook. Like, it was a great, like, hour-long session. throwing guys under the bus? Just throwing people under the bus, saying things he shouldn't say. It was, yeah! it was fantastic. So we're going to... We're gonna try to do that, like maybe once a week or once every two weeks. You know, get a we we sort of did this a while back, and we're gonna try to get back to it, like bringing a guest into the virtual lounge, because it, it's a like a show like this. It's broadcast live to Facebook. It's a little different, but when you have them in the virtual lounge and it's not broadcast anywhere, you get a slightly different take. And in fact, our guest that we're gonna introduce in a second was in the virtual lounge, just mere days ago also hanging out with us you never know who's gonna show up. yeah it was great so um let's bring him in right now i think nick has been on the show maybe as much as anybody as we've ever had well definitely the most in studio in studio oh he's in got that in down. studio he's got that he's got the, that hammered because he's been in studio multiple times ladies and gentlemen nick malilo the uh aka chief of the broadleaf aka nick aragua Dude, welcome back to Smoke Night Live, my friend. Pleasure to be here, guys. Very excited to be hanging out with you. Um, was in the fields all day and just sitting back having some coffee and a cigar. And uh, I think I was the first one in studio, right, Eric? I believe you were the very first. Well, it wasn't we talked even... about this last time. Yeah. I got to find this out for sure. I don't even think it was in a studio at the time. Like It was just like unfinished it was just like a no i wasn't it wasn't like it is now but it was still in that in that space it, existed, it was still super barely. cool yeah <laughs> oh yeah, dude no, was, you should it see it now impressive. nick you should see it now it's it's amazing now i mean, I mean we got a hot tub in here we, yeah it's 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 incredible it's gone to on. new heights <laughs> Half of the you entire get, studio is, is just hot tub. It's a hot tub it's time machine. It's kind of unfortunate. It's like right in the way all the time. <laughs> we did it, though. No, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're glad to have Nick back on the show. Nick from Foundation Cigar Company. Nick, I couldn't be more excited to have you on the show. And tonight, really, what I want to do tonight, I really want to get some good viewer questions. So if you have good that would be questions great. for Nick. Would... I mean, because I mean, I've asked everything... I could possibly ask of Nick. We I, know we've covered it everything at all. about Nick, but we are going to talk. Yeah, you heard this story before. You know what I mean? It's we, like... but Nick, I've got some. I've got, <laughs> we got some good music. We got some good music questions. In fact, on the second half of tonight's show, the second half, second part, after the commercial break, we're going to do the weekly top three. And Jordan, the the topic yes. for the weekly top three uh, in the second half of the show is the top three music videos of all time. So we're going to get Nick's... Nick, you better start thinking. Nick's take on the top three music videos of all time. And I asked this question because, Nick, you are in a music video. You know, <laughs> you know, that might have been on my list. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, we shot, we shot an amazing video. Um, it's uh, almost a year this, this June. Uh, friends of mine called The Reminders, actually from Colorado. Colorado Springs um, had sent me a song last May, the beginnings of a track called Foundation. And um, they sent me, uh, you know, the first part of it in May. And I listened to the first verse and I said, man, this is unbelievable. We got to shoot a music video. So they were traveling in Hawaii. I was traveling all over the place. So we managed to fly down to Nicaragua in June on a Monday we shot the video in the fields on the factory floor in the tobacco barns Tuesday, Wednesday, and um, yeah, had it for debut at the trade show last year. All right, so, so wait, Nick. You know, let I want to talk. Yeah. I want to talk about this video, but the people that are paying attention and watching on Facebook, I want to give them a flavor of the video. So we're gonna watch like thirty seconds of it, if that's okay, guys. You want to catch? Oh snap! Okay, let's catch thirty <laughs> seconds of this video. It's amazing. Like this is a fantastic video, guys. Here we go. The reminders. It's called Foundation. Check it out. We'll do like thirty seconds. Foundation. You see it. Welcome 
to the valley of kings Where we will and enable To rise like burning fire Active volcano Salute to rebels Poets and people Working for something greater Alright dude check that Whoa, out that, is, that was cool That is cool brother And that looks like It's in AJ's factory right Am I right? Yeah Yeah And um, some different fields Around town uh, We shot it in the Esteli market So the, the outdoor uh, food market Bunch of it shot close to my house in Esteli. A lot of great uh, graffiti walls. My art director, uh, Alex Garcia, was in it. And um, it just it just sort of happened, man. Within a really short period of time, we were all really excited and riding a very um, amazing creative wave. And it just all came together. And my, um, my videographer from Esteli, Kenneth Espinosa, edited it within a week's time. So, um, Jeez. pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. So, you know, being a hip hop fan, uh, there's a lot of hip hop culture that loves cigars. I mean, so many hip hop artists love cigars, especially the ones I listened to when I was growing up. Um, so I never saw a hip hop video shot on a cigar factory floor. So I thought it was a, it was a cool idea. I oh. just want to know how you got a yeah. uh, drone into Nicaragua. They don't take you know drones. That, that, I got to tell you, shooting that video was actually a little um, nerve wracking because um, of all the political stuff that had been going down. So some of the shots we sh we shot on the street, we were kind of a little nerve wrack nerve wracked uh, there. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, luckily we managed to do it. Some of the drone shots were shot. Uh, my man Kenneth did them. Um, so, yeah, he was he was able to pull them off. No, that's that's super cool, and I really dig like Nick the scenes when you like you're in it with the reminders, like you're kind of yeah. walking with them. Are are they like playing the song on like like a like a beatbox or something so that you can hear it and you can kind of walk to the beat, or how does that work? You know, I'm waiting for Kenneth to come out with the behind the scenes mm. because we had so much fun. So it's myself. And the foundation art director, Alex, we were holding the speakers a lot of the time. So we're behind blasting the music, especially shooting in like the outdoor market was awesome because we just had two large boom boxes and we were playing it. Uh, and I played my best Puff Daddy. You nice. know, that's my that was my Puff Daddy, uh, you know, was hanging there, out in the was, videos. Was and, there uh, like a question, you know, did the question come up in pre-production? Like, should Nick actually be in the video? Like, should we have him in the video? Or should it just be like yeah. the artists, you like, know? Yeah, there was a little bit of that. I think um, <laughs> I, I managed to sneak myself in there. No, I think it was cool because the Reminders and I had met and we always talked about, you know, traveling to Nicaragua. So that was like five years in the making. So they let me in. So I was. Oh, yeah, it was great. I was happy. Uh, Mike Hagen totally says uh, that video is nice, but it needs uh, more cowbell. <laughs> more cow Definitely more cowbell. <laughs> Definitely more cowbell. You gotta have You're more totally cowbell. right. <gasps> so that yeah. video, that, I, 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 you met them at yeah. Red Rocks, right? Is it, or you hung out with them at Red Rocks or something? There's some sort of so story. Red Rocks were involved so, in some way. So eventually, Red Rocks was involved because okay. they ended up opening for um, Mos Def and Talib Kweli okay. at, at Red Rocks. Um, so that was like a highlight, the first time at Red Rocks. But I had met them um, about six years ago now. I actually always wanted to go see Mos Def, and he was playing in Denver. Mos Def, Mos Def. This, yeah, about six. So I planned a whole trip from Nicaragua to meet a friend of mine in Denver and go see Mos Def. And Moe's Def ended up canceling like days before, but somehow they booked Nas at Cervantes. So oh. I said, of course, let me let me keep my travel plan. So I flew from Managua to Denver, got off at the airport. My friend picked me up. We went straight to Cervantes. There was one opening act. And then the next opening act was a, um, a, a gentleman and a woman that got up on that stage and just lit the stage on fire. Like one of the best live performances mm. I've had ever seen. And it was uh, Asia and Samir from The Reminders. So we ended up um, chatting after the show at the merch table. And then over a period of time, we were just, you know, messaging back and forth. And then we ended up meeting one night, like maybe a year later for dinner. And we talked for like three, three and a half hours straight. And it was like I, I had known them for all my life. And we wow. just became really good friends. 
I got to go on tour with them in Colorado. I got to go on tour with them. Mm. They opened for a band called Hieroglyphics in the Northeast, which is uh, old school hip hop. Um, you know, they're just in- incredible people, and they become like family. And they so, uh, they smoke um, cigars. Yeah. Yeah. So you we'll- know they do. They're. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's What's the really that? interesting part is like they must be kind of into cigars like I mean in the in, video. You know, they definitely have learned a lot, you know, uh, being friends and seeing the process for them really I think opened their eyes, you know, seeing the process from seed to cigar is is pretty eye-opening. So they've been, you know, smoking Asia actually smokes a pipe from time to time. She likes uh pipe tobacco, so it's been um, – it was definitely eye-opening, I think, to see that process. It's great to see that process um, through people's eyes, you know, fresh right. eyes, which is pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, that, that came out of – Kenneth, um, my director for videography, um, I always had had the idea to do a time-lapse video from seed to cigar. So we were actually working on that video um, for a good year. Um, so you check out our, uh, YouTube seed to cigar foundation cigars. If you just type in seed to cigar on YouTube, I think it's the second one that comes up. So it literally starts with seeds in my hand and brings you through the whole process right to pa- the packing of the tabernacle 142 Havana seed. Right. Number yeah, one in fact, cigar Nick, dojo of the year. Yeah. Nick, I watched, I watched that again today. I've seen it like four or five times. It's like an 11 yeah. minute, it's like an 11 minute long video or so. And Short there, film. There's yeah. a there's a lot of seed to cigar videos in existence. Uh, if you search on YouTube, you'll find them from lots of different factories. But the thing I like about your video is it's 11 minutes long. Like it just shows you like the most important parts. Boom, boom, boom. There's a lot of really cool like time lapse stuff. There's a, a lot of cool shots. It's probably one of the best like shot and edited sort of seed to cigar videos I've ever seen. It's in, it's amazing. That means a lot coming from you, Eric. Well, I mean, you know, that's hey. yeah. Kenneth did it. Kenneth did uh, an amazing job on it, um, and I, that's what I was kind of hoping for because I have so many people that ask about the process. So I, I wanted to be able to capture it in that concise manner that you know really showed that you know some of the coolest parts for me to just see the seed beds growing, the the tobacco when it's in the field growing, and then in the curing barns to see it turn from green to yellow to brown that that whole process is to me really cool in the time lapse yeah because you don't you don't need to sit there and watch a 60 minute long thing it's going to be a huge investment this is just like basically watching yes. three music videos it's it's got some cool it's got a cool uh soundtrack and boom 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 you get to see the whole thing so check that out guys uh, search for that on youtube it's it's a super cool video brother i, I really appreciate a, that. i actually did a two minute version a minute version too which is really quick but yeah you know some of them um some of them are pretty cool like if you there's a couple hours i think davidoff does one for a couple hours and they're really good but again i wanted to get it a little bit more concise for you know right a little less commitment of time all right, folks, so here we are, uh, episode 248. We're speaking with Nick Malilo, Foundation Cigars. If you've got questions, so, uh, let's just get right into them, Jordan. So we've yeah, got some Deep audience Pittman. questions. Tell us about the artists you have uh, in, the, uh, in your booth for the trade shows. You always have uh, the most impressive booth at the show. Yeah, so my, my art director, his name is Alex Garcia. His, his paint art name, uh, street name is Thief Operandi. So Thief, as I call him, I've been friends with Thief since 2003, 2004, since I moved to Nicaragua. So he was one of the first graffiti artists in Esteli in the mid-90s. And um, we've just always had really similar interest in um, reggae music, in hip-hop, and culture, and history. Just um, we really you know, get along on so many levels. So it was a no brainer when I was starting the company to, um, really hire him to really, you know, express a lot of these, these brands that I wanted to get to the market. 
So um, he he pretty much is directing, you know, all of the bands, the boxes, um, a lot of the advertisements and posters. And then for the trade show, um, we ended up collaborating with a group in Nicaragua called Atoll, which is a collective. Um, Atoll actually is, means a collection of different styles in Nicaragua. So uh, they were traditionally mural painters in Esteli, and I had been seeing these amazing murals throughout town for like a couple of years, and both Thief and I couldn't find out who who these people were, and we went to a house party one day and ended up meeting um, three great artists who are a toll, and we ended up hiring them as part of the art team for Foundation, and they did a lot of the individual art pieces at the booth, um, and they always do. We did about a 50 foot mural on the back of the booth, uh, about eight feet tall, 50 feet long. So they did a lot of that that handmade art at the trade show booths. Oh, yeah. You, for the past you couple never, of years. Uh, a lot of guys will reuse their booths for two to three years. You've I've, you've had a new booth every year. Every year, yeah, I've been trying to mix it up. This year, I actually was going to keep the structure because this past. I put a lot of work into the general outline of last year's booth, which was basically we ended up constructing two 13 foot pyramids um, to display all the products. So they were 13 foot wood pyramids. And then below all of the brands uh, were displayed for customers to see. Um, So I was going to stick with that this year, but all the art every year changes. So I really like to keep it fresh. You know, especially when people are going to trade shows, people are coming to see a show. So, you know, to see the same thing every year to me, um, you know, kind of gets a little bit boring. So I want to keep it fresh and exciting for people to come to the booth and and hang out and see what Foundation is all about. We got a uh, quick one uh, from uh, Patrick Larkin. Are you coming to Rocky Mountain Cigar Fest if there is such a thing? you know, I actually am, was supposed to make a call this week to talk about this. Yeah, if it's if I, I'm, to my knowledge, it's still a go. So um, I'm not going to be doing many events this year at all. Um, so I think that's probably the the only one I'm going to be doing. What about okay? Even if there isn't one, I say you come anyways, and we just put on a dojo. You know, party. we're we're gonna have a dojo party. We're just gonna do a dojo. Good. You know. That's that sounds good because there's a good friend of mine out in Colorado and he's 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 kind of sick and um, I want to come see him so um, I'll definitely probably do that. That'd be great. Hey Nick, so from your perspective, from your company's perspective, how does the fact that there will be no summer trade show affect you in a practical sense? I can tell you on a personal level, I'm very relieved. Mm. Um, because man, the show takes a lot out. I mean, I'm literally prepping from, you know, February until right up until July when the show is happening, we put so much into the booth and then, you know, Vegas just takes a lot out of you. So, um, I'm a little bit relieved cause this is the first time I'm able to actually have a summer. You know, um, right. literally, I, I put my heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears into that booth and preparing. And then after the show, it's just nonstop. So um, personally, I'm a little bit relieved uh, as far as like the company stands. We're just going to end up doing things virtually with all of our customers. We got a great um, sales team. We have a great office here in Connecticut. So um, we're basically just going to be doing similar things you know, similar show. And we, we don't do deals, you know, except once a year at the trade show. So we'll probably be, you know, doing those and then announcing new products, but new products are not going to ship until September. Mm. Um, I'm going to be, this year is the five year anniversary of War Wednesday. So I was planning on launching the, uh, Cinco Aniversario de War Wednesday. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that news? It, man, it's been a blur. You know, yeah. I mean, I've been kind of talking about it. There's nothing official, official yet because I'm still, you know, working on timing and details. And I actually just 
just got some of the uh, sample packaging today. And, uh, you know, things have definitely been uh, delayed because of everything that's going on. Right. But um, hopefully, I'll probably announce it in July with the details, but it's definitely not going to ship until maybe late August, September. All right. Is it hard, but though, it's it, gonna be, since, since you're not able to, like, meet with a lot of retailers face-to-face like you normally would, you know, at the trade show? Uh, does does that yeah. present issues for you guys trying to get the word out as far as what you got is, you know, the new I mean, stuff and... That's definitely, yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to make it, um, you know, more more challenging. And that's the one thing I love about the trade show is that it's the only time where everybody's in one place where you can see everybody. So, so yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot of media, you know, as far as video work. We're, we're working on a lot of video work, um, you know, still photography. Uh, we have our new website up, so you know, mailers going out. So we have good communication with our stores right now. So we're just going to, you know, do the best we can. Speaking of your website, Nick, your slogan on your website is always on the level. Why, why is it your slogan? Yes. You know, I think just it's the core competency of the, the company is just to always deal with people straight up, you know, with integrity and also, you know, the pyramid logo, as you see is foundation, is um really represents balance right the pyramid is the representation of the balancing point between polarities so extremes so in order to have that balance you have to be on the level right if you start if you start the company off kilter you know you're just you're going to end up messing up that pyramid so it kind of speaks just to the the core competency of of the company and not coming from any angles and just dealing with people straight up, you know, just being honest. Just just being yourself, brother. So right? uh, we got yeah. one uh, from this sort of unknown character. Uh, one Cancel asks, Nick, who is your cigar industry man crush? <laughs> A cigar industry man crush? Gotta, oh, you got to have Let's see. Huh. I mean, my man crush was always, um, God rest his soul, uh, old man Padron. Mm. Ooh. That was my that was my man. He was, um, you know, when I first moved to Nicaragua, meeting him was like the ultimate for me. So that's a good one. I would say I would say that the old man Padron. All right, wow. Jordan, let's do a quick commercial, and then we're getting the second half of the show. This show is sponsored by JR Cigars, one of the world's largest online cigar stores. JR's inventory ranges from everyday bundled cigars to incredibly high end boxes, including the brand new exclusive. Romeo e Julieta Passion. Don't forget to check out their social media pages, including YouTube, where they feature cigar reviews, interviews, and their famous weekly top five videos. Check out JR Cigars for all of your premium cigar needs. So, Nick, uh, got a huge crowd on Facebook tonight, got some questions. Maybe we'll get in one or two more questions before we go to the weekly top five or top three, I'm sorry. Week the top three. We... Oh, there's tons of them. So let's let's throw a couple more uh, questions. Christopher uh, Brown, can you tell us more about the history of the CT142 wrapper? Mm, good Which question. is pretty pretty cool <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I'm actually smoking one right now, and I have to say it was it's pretty darn tasty. <laughs> um, so Cuban <laughs> Cuban seed is kind of debatable, like when Cuban seed came to Connecticut, but as far as I could track it down, 1870s, um, the seed came to Connecticut. So you had broadleaf also at that time and Cuban seed, you know, it kind of fell out of favor because broadleaf, the leaf structure is a lot larger. You could get, get a lot more yield from it. And then you have Connecticut shade that came into the existence in the early 1900s. So you didn't really have, uh, you know, much use of the Cuban seed also because it's very difficult to ferment. In my, my opinion, it's one of the most difficult leaves to ferment because it's not as thick as broadleaf. It can't take as much in, in the pilones all the time. It's thinner, but yet it has a tremendous amount of oil on it. I mean, it's just so oily. I was looking at a, a lot of it today 
you know, my hands are just covered and that's what makes it so tasty and so amazing. Uh Um, but there's a window when that tobacco is done in fermentation and the window is very small. So if you don't hit that window, it's not burning properly. The taste is not going to be right. If you go over that window, you literally destroy all the tobacco because you break down the cellular walls of the leaf so much, it will literally disintegrate. So you're, you're, at this like two and a half, three year period of this stuff is curing. If you don't keep a close eye on it, you know, guys see me sometimes in front of Pilon taking pictures. Oh, you got the greatest job in the world. There's nothing more stressful than, than being in charge of curing fermentation piles because you have hundreds of thousands of dollars and it literally can go awry really quickly if you're not on top of it. Wow. And you can't get back the money and you can't get back the leaf. So, it's um, really difficult to ferment. Typically in the valley, the leaf was very susceptible to black shank in the field, to sicknesses. So the experiment station in Connecticut, that's the station that works with farmers to uh, strengthen seed varieties to help them fight disease, um, had worked on seed varieties that were more resistant to black shank and disease in the field. So that, that's where the 142 seed comes from. It was one of the seeds that was more um, strength, uh, mm. it's more resistance to a lot of disease in the field. For me, then, that translates into a stronger, healthier, even oilier, tastier wow. tobacco. Wow. So, By the way, Jordan, blank, yeah. bla- Black Shank was my nickname in high school. <laughs> just, just so you know that. Yeah. TMI. TMI. <laughs> just throwing that out there. I'm so... Gonna... So Nick, way too much information. Way too much. <laughs> uh, most guys are going to know that you also blended the T fifty two. It kind of has a similar name structure. It's Savannah Seed in Connecticut. Are these just different versions of the same sort of hybrid? No. So, so that's a dip, so type fifty two was also another type of Cuban of Cuban seed grown in the valley. Type fifty one is broadleaf, mm. right? So then you have all different types of seed varieties. So you'll have farmers that use different seed varieties. Um, some of them think certain ones are better, cer- certain ones aren't as good. So you'll, you'll, you'll definitely have a variation of different seed varieties. But it's, you know, it's the same. It's Cuban seed, but it's a different seed variety, Okay, if that makes sense. By the way, I'm smoking yeah. the original. There's not... The original Tabernacle, right we here. We are baby. smoking Tabernacles nice. from uh, Nick. You had this nice. special cigar that humidor looks... that you would give out. Uh, were, were these size? Were these a uh, special size? Was this more aged? What was so the... the? That is a Corona. That was a thirty count. Um, we only made two hundred of those boxes. Excuse me. Um, and that's a special blend. So when I blended tab- Tabernacle, I had a bunch of different blends you know, that I thought could have made the final box. And that's one variation of the Corona. Oof. So it's amazing. It is aging yeah. quite nicely. It's that's got to be like amazing. four years old. Yeah. All right. We you know, got, with, oh, sorry. Go with, on. with the Cuban seed, you can see there's very few companies that use this tobacco. You know, DE is one. I think Pepin uses, what's the name? It's like an H. HK, have yeah. you guys heard of that one? H2K, CT, H- something. <laughs> that's that's also another seed variety of the Cuban seed grown in Connecticut, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I I believe Partagas at one point used also, but there's not many people that use it. Again, going back to, it's so freaking difficult to ferment. Mm. So it's one of the longest, you know, in the fermentation piles. And it's one of the more difficult. Hence, you don't see a lot of people using it because it's very challenging. So you essentially started uh, fermenting this tobacco right when the company started. Correct. And it took three years to come out. Yeah. And then that's that's why I didn't come off with a broadleaf also the first year because that was in a lot of people, you know, my for my launch brand were – expecting uh broadleaf but that wasn't ready either how about so. uh we got uh, bill carney says uh i've always found coffee to be the best compliment for broadleaf cigars what's your preference to pair with a broadleaf cigar you know i'm a coffee fanatic so i i mean i'm always drinking coffee and, and smoking you know cigars to me it's it's just one of the best compliments to to a lot of these blends 
just because, you know, I, I love cigars that have, you know, dark espresso, coffee notes, cocoa. So I think the tabernacle and coffee pairing is, you know, for me, one of the best. You know, uh, by the way, guys, uh, just a side note, because uh, Nick was just talking about the P-Loans. Jordan, if you watch the... P-Loans. The, if you watch the video, P-Loans. his video, Seed to Cigar, the th- one thing, just keep your eyes peeled, because they do they do a lot of, like, time lapses. Mm. And one of the time lapses, Nick, is the guys that are stacking a P-Loan. And in, yeah. in real time, you'd never see this happen. But in time lapse, you do see it happen. The the weight of the tobacco just squeezes that pilon down. And you can never mm. see that in any other way other than in that time lapse. That's really cool. Like the guys are like stacking it and then you can just see it just like, like just the weight of the tobacco, like pushing it down. It's really interesting. So it's interesting you bring that up, Eric, because that is what triggers the fermentation. So the pressure and the moisture from the leaf is actually the triggering point for the fermentation process. Mm. So hence, if you see those, you know, typically we're working in seven to 8,000 pounds because that gives you a decent amount of pressure, depending on the tobacco that you're curing to trigger a decent amount of heat to get the process going. So that's a great observation. Yeah, it was. I mean, I'd, I, as I was watching that video, I, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I've never, I mean, I've seen like P loans be stacked 100 times, but I've, you don't see that right. unless it was like time a time lapse. lapse. And you can see it like just like, you know, like just, just like moving down. So I highly recommend checking that video out. It's super interesting. Nick, um, how much stock do you put in like, there's sometimes guys that will talk about like, oh, we do a, a smaller or a circular pilon compared to like these big old rectangles that you see. Is there much difference? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm typically, you know, used to working in the larger um, fermentation piles. To me, some of the smaller fermentation piles is if you're you're trying to put a, a little finishing touch on them. Mm. Instead of really, you know, triggering it too far. It's if it needs a little bit more to go. Um, But again, everybody's got a different style, Jordan. So, you know, every factory kind of works works differently. But typically those smaller pilones, you know, I would use for that last tocasito, that last touch. Nick, isn't that isn't that sort of like the cool thing about like premium cigars is like there can be like 13, 14, however many different ways to do a thing, and that might cause a different reaction or a slightly different flavor. Like, you you think to yourself, like, okay, how many different ways could a cigar possibly be made? Like, there's this kind of tobacco, there's that kind of tobacco, there's this kind of aging, there's that, you know. Th- those are all the variables that cause this, d- you know, variance in what we taste as cigar smokers, and we all love those variances it's awesome that different people are doing different things because that's what gives us cigar smokers as cigar geeks something unique to try and different totally i mean and that and that's how i i learned you know here i was 24 you know learning from all these older cuban gentlemen nicaraguans and i'd go to one person and say you know how do you, how is this done they would say this is how you do it right that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Then I go to that guy and say, this is, this is how you do it. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Then you go to this guy and say, this is how you do it. No, that's not the way you do it. Or, you know, people get very specific to old school guys and what you blend together. You can't blend, you know, dark binders with dark wrappers or, you know, certain people have their own way. Some people use double binders. Some people use single so there is, you know, um, it's that's infinite. how I it's learned. It's infinite, took, right? It's infinite. Yeah. There's there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's like putting somebody into a kitchen with the same ingredients and then, you know, some they're going to come out with to- something totally different. Um, you know, each person, if well, they don't have a recipe, it's like, you know. Yeah, it's like it's, they make their own music, style. Like there's only how many notes are there, but you can come up with literally an infinite amount of songs from them. Right. Um, we got another question. Yeah. Uh, K.M. Clark, what do you do to make tobacco as peppery, spicy as you can get? I want my retro hail to catch hair on fire. <laughs> Yo, what's up, Mr. Clark? Um, you know, I would say you, you would l- use a lot of uh, heavier style visos and, 
and Ligeros. Um, you can definitely get a lot of that from Esteli. Esteli, as far as you know, the growing regions is, in my opinion, uh, definitely a lot stronger. So, you know, really up those heavier, thicker filler tobaccos, and that would definitely contribute to getting some real strength and. Uh, will be very potent on the retro. So you'd go pepper more towards priming as opposed to like growing region then? You know, also growing regions and seed varieties definitely uh, contribute to that. But I would say generally speaking, I mean, if you're using, um, you know, heavier ligeros from, you know, the upper primings of the plant, you know, you're going to get some some real good spice and power. Now, Nick. I mean, I know some re, you know some fields in in uh, Esteli. Sorry for cutting you no, off. No, no, no. It's all right. If you if you smoke those straight and retrohale, I mean, you're gonna get. It's gonna give you that flush face and probably make <laughs> you pass out. Nick, it wasn't that long ago when like a double liero cigar was like wow, like whoa, my god, double liero, wow. It seems like. Like the palate of the American, you know, premium cigar smoker is just more insatiable appetite towards stronger cigars. Now, like a double hero isn't that crazy even to, you know, to, to, to as a marketing plan. That's not like a. It's like, know, that's it? That's it? What? God, there's there's got to be more than that. Now we're doing all kinds of stuff. Is wh- What do you make of that? Is that just like the palate evolving? Are people just wanting more and more and more of a certain thing? Or how do you. What do you. What do you think about that? I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's just like people that are more into cigars. Maybe I think, because I think still, you know, the the biggest sellers are actually Connecticut Shade cigars. I mean, if you right. look volume wise, Connecticut Shade cigars are actually the most consumed out of any cigars. So I think more of the hardcore. I think like the bourbon, and you know, you have connoisseurs and guys that really get into it and their palates, you know, sort of get used to strength and then they, they want a little bit more. And, you know, some, some tobacco guys, they really get into it. They can take that strength. Right. So I, for, uh, for me, Jordan, I don't know about for you, but for me, I don't know what it is. Maybe there's some sort of weird, like biological problem with myself. I t- t- like, like nicotine, doesn't like the yeah, strength the, it doesn't affect the more you me. smoke the harder it becomes to discern the strength like right it's like it doesn't it, it doesn't, doesn't i don't i don't right. feel it at all like somebody's oh my god this is going to make you turn green like it never for me i don't know why that is i'm sure like nicotine probably affects different people in different ways and i'm just that's by that's chance thing, man. you know well I, there is a funny story I mean, that uh on last year's rocky mountain cigar fest we were hanging out with skip martin and he's coming out with his his uh more powerful version of the Neanderthal, and my dad's saying the same spiel. I I can't taste strength. I can't taste. It just doesn't affect me in any way. So Skip gives him the cigar. My dad smokes it, and then he just leaves. And, and that had nothing to do. And with then the we cigar. never we never saw him again the rest of the night. He just went to bed. I gotta. Fu- I gotta. Fu- uh, uh, I gotta uh, shut up. I don't even care. Okay. Okay. We gotta. Uh, here we go. Another question. Uh, right, another question. Audience. <laughs> Nick, the market for Connecticut uh, broadleaf is on fire, but the acreage is diminishing. What can we do besides raise the price? You know, so the demand for broadleaf, yeah, is through the roof um, right now. The acreage has actually been increasing because of the demand. Um so there's a lot of Connecticut shade. You know, Connecticut shade is pretty much, I think there's only maybe 50 to 100 acres being grown in Connecticut because most of it's moved to Ecuador. So there's actually been a little bit of an ex- expansion of uh, broadleaf. The problem was, the problem is a lot of the broadleaf market is driven by the mass market machine made cigars. Um, so like cigars like Backwoods and that that whole blunt market because of the legalization of cannabis has been expanding, right? So if you right. see over the past 20 years, and a lot of it is expanding in the demand for now more natural leaf products in the mass market. So a lot of those products were made with homogenized leaf, which is basically tobacco dust and paper. Now there's a huge demand for natural leaf. This is contributed to the demand of broadleaf 
And also in the premium side, there is a huge demand for broadleaf. Two, two growing seasons ago was the rainiest Connecticut in 50 years. So you had a tremendous amount of rain. So the tobacco was in the curing barns at the end of the summer, and it still continued to rain. I was looking at tobacco just days before Thanksgiving, and it was still raining out, and tobacco hadn't been taken down yet because there was it was just too wet. So unfortunately, there was a super high demand, and there wasn't enough tobacco in the market. I was lucky, lucky to get really great tobacco, but we didn't get a large amount of it. Um, but you have a lot more acreage being grown this year um, in the valley because of the demand. Hmm. I've got one. Uh, so. How come, I mean, you see the shade being uh, mostly grown in Ecuador these days, but how come broadleaf doesn't really, hasn't been transported much? Great question. Yeah. So, um, that is, that is a great question because of the – this is in my opinion, right? Connecticut shade is very thin. You know, It's much more, in my mind, more of a neutral style tobacco. Um, Ecuador was able to – because of the cloud coverage in Ecuador during growing season, was able to yield a tremendous amount of wrapper um, from the plant because it's getting shade from those clouds. Um, Connecticut couldn't keep up with the competition because the, the Ecuador plant was yielding just so great tobacco. Broadleaf can't be mimicked because you can't get the same flavor, right? So because of the soil in the Connecticut River Valley, you have 30,000 acres north of Hartford um, that is just perfect for growing broadleaf because of the sandy loom soil, right? So I don't know if we talked about this before, but Connecticut in um, Mohawk means alongside the great tidal river. So the Connecticut River is 406 miles long. It used to be a lake called Lake Hitchcock. Before that, it was the ice cap, right? They had a huge ice sheet there. It receded to the lake. The lake bed, when it formed down to the river, ended up filtering as it was emptying down into the Long Island Sound, it emptied north of Harford in this 30,000 acres of sandy loom, like lake bed in this area. What that does is it filters water, right? Mm. So there's like this much sand, and then you have clay down deep. So the water filters through all that sand, and the roots are following the water. Mm. So then it can latch onto that clay. So that makes for very strong heavy broadleaf tobacco, wow. which is in the valley comes out really because of these elements naturally sweet and earthy. And I've yet to really find an area that's able to replicate like that sweetness mm. of Connecticut broadleaf, that body and that strength. So Interesting. it's, it's unique to the valley. Whereas again, Connecticut shade to me is more of a neutral style because it's so thin and because the cellular walls of the leaf are much thinner, to me, you can you can kind of uh, get away with that change. Is broadleaf natural to America? Is that or is that yeah? Brought over? So there, there's some. They say there's five seeds from which all seed varieties come from, right? And that's um, habanesis, which is the Cuban. San Andreas from Mexico. They actually say the San Andreas Negro seed comes pre-Cuban seed. So mm. um, they said it came from Mexico into the Caribbean. But you have Cabanesis Cuban, San Andreas, Matafina from Brazil, Sumatra, and then Broadleaf. And then from those varieties, mm. you basically have everything else. Connecticut Shade. You know, for example, Connecticut Shade is a hybridization between uh, Cuban seed, broadleaf, and Sumatra. Whoa. Hmm. I did not they know They hybridized that. that. I didn't know the, that. The, yeah. In, so, yeah. So, in the late 1800s, the Dutch were destroying Connecticut broadleaf market and Cuban seed in Connecticut because the Dutch were growing in Sumatra. So, the Dutch have been involved in Sumatra, Indo Indonesia, trading tobacco for, you know, hundreds of years. So, they were growing a very high yielding wrapper grade tobacco because in Sumatra, 
a lot of the fields were being covered by jungle, right? So you didn't have the sun exposure. So you got a very silky, high yielding plant that was yielding tremendous amounts of wrapper. That was destroying broadleaf. I mean, think about broadleaf. Broadleaf is really like a binder grade tobacco. Hmm. It's very veiny. So your stock are very thick. The plants are very short and stocky. Cuban seed is still, you know, shorter, stockier, still kind of heavy. Um, so the Sumatra was destroying it. So in response to that, the Department of Agriculture in Connecticut started experimenting to compete with the Dutch because they were just destroying broadleaf and, and Cuban seed. So they took Cuban seed, Connecticut, broadleaf and Sumatra seed and came out with a whole new uh, type of tobacco, of what we know as Connecticut shade. Wow. And then a gentleman, I think his name was Barber, had the idea of mimicking the conditions of the jungles of Sumatra and started growing the tobacco under cheese cl- uh, cheese cloth tents. What? So the shaded tents, yeah, so all the shade was grown under, you know, hundreds of acres of, they shaded, you've seen shade grown tobacco, right? Of course. Yeah. Where they put tents over, yeah. So they started to, that, that was developed in Connecticut to mimic the growing regions of Sumatra. So once you put that shade tent over the fields, you create a microclimate. You know, you have a 10% higher humidity level. You're able to grow much thinner wrapper grade tobacco. So that's that was the birth of Connecticut shade in like 1901. And wow. then, you know, it, pr- it pretty much dominated until the late 80s when um, some families took the seed down to Ecuador. And, you know, Ecuador they noticed was really cloudy all the time. <laughs> and since the late eighties till now, they've just really, you know, really dominated, um, because there's such high yielding plants. Like when you go to Ecuador, you see those plants, you're, you know, they're, they're yielding like 80, 85% wrapper from the plant, which is just, you know, unfortunately we couldn't keep up here in Connecticut for the shade. So Nick, uh, speaking of, speaking of, tobacco types uh seems like the last year or so like cameroon is sort of kind of making a resurgence uh t- talk about cameroon yeah. rappers like uh i i, I really you know don't, I, I i didn't know what i thought about it that much until this past year and it's a fun it's a fun one to explore what do you make of that you know cameroon uh, to be honest with you my experience with cameroon hasn't been extensive so um I fell in love with the tobacco back in the 90s because I was in love with, um, you know, Fuente, Don Carlos, uh, Hemingways. And, um, you know, it was really oily, lots of tooth, like, I mean, just flavor pockets. You know, back in like 95, 96, Partagas Naturales, you know, when General was still owned by the Colmans, they were using a lot of Cameroon. No cellophane. Those would come. I mean, just incredible. Over the years, you know, I didn't I haven't used too much of it because there was a lot of political problems. Mm. Um, It was really hard to get supply. From what I know, the seed came from Sumatra in the 60s and was actually planted in Cameroon. So interesting. um, Yeah, it was of Sumatra origin and then in the 60s grown there. And then there's just been a lot of. I think difficulties. So to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not, it's not one of my fortes. Um, and the problem with it is one of the reasons why I didn't use it because I couldn't get a lot of the leaves were like really small. So you would basically, I would get offers and they would only be in that 15 inch to 17. I couldn't get larger 19 to 21 inch leaves to really make larger sizes. So, um, I kind of why kind of steered away from it a lot of why why is yeah. it the Cameroon more expensive just because it's in like a more exotic hard to reach region or yeah is there more yeah than that? you know when I I think that's one of the reasons yeah I mean there's not much of it um, when it comes down to it Jordan it, it has everything to do with yield right mm-hmm. I mean if you're not getting from your crop wrapper and you end up getting binder and filler, 
the price of your wrapper is going to go through the roof, right? Because, you, you know, a lot of these, these crops, you're growing them for wrapper. If you're not, you know, some of these crops, people don't want the filler, you know, like, or binder a lot of times. So if you're not getting the yields from the field and you have a bad growing season, I mean, that, that price just keeps going up. But I think with Cameroon, it's just been supply. <laughs> like there hasn't been a lot at right. all. So, so, so before we get into our, our final segment, we talk about some music. Uh, Nick, I'm just curious, like, you know, you've been in this industry, you've, you've been in, in Nicaragua, you've lived there, you've done, you've, you've, do, you know, you've done the, all of the stuff. Like some people like are in the industry and they've never like actually been in, in the thick of things. Like you've been in the thick of things. Now you've started your own company. Do you... Do you still enjoy cigars? Like, do you still just enjoy sometimes just sitting down, not thinking about yields and prices and FDA and this and that, and you're just able to just grab a cigar, maybe it's yours, maybe it's somebody else's, and just enjoy cigars for, for what they are? You know, it, this time has definitely allowed me the opportunity to do that more. So... Right. um you know, it slowed me down. I've just been on the run for five years, man, just like nonstop. So having this time has actually been been really good to just be able to sit down. And, um, you know, our office has been closed, but our office is on a 50-acre tobacco field. So I would actually be, go up there, you know, have a little seating outside and just chill and, and have a smoke by myself and, and actually just enjoy. Yeah, so... Yeah, sometimes uh, even I'm being my, more even, conscious to do that. Right, even myself, like just is, and I'm not nearly as involved as you are, but sometimes it's great just to like try to like set everything aside, go in the backyard, grab a cigar, and just enjoy it for what it is, and not think about like what this cigar might rate, how would we review it, none of that. Just I just totally. enjoy a cigar, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's how I, you know, that's how I, a, a, I choose the cigars that I come out with right at the end of the day it's just like do I have that experience that you're talking about and not thinking about any of that but just like was this an awesome experience right. you know and I I think um, that's what that's why I fell in love with cigars right is exactly what you're talking about because it you know really it does it gets your your mind out of you know the past or the future and just you know, brings you to the present and uh, enjoying. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that's what it's all about. All right, let's talk about some music. So before, we're going to, the weekly top three is the top three. Weekly top three! Not not yet, Jordan, not yet, not yet. Uh, Slow down. uh, (laughs) Before we get to the weekly top three, before the show started, Scott and Matt and Jordan and myself were talking about uh, bands that we saw in concert before they were popular. And I want to ask Nick about that. I'll I'll go ahead and share my experience. Jordan, you can share yours as well, and then right. Nick can think about it while we're talking. Like I remember seeing, I went to see the English Beat at Red Rocks, right? English Beat, and the opening act was REM. And I remember specifically, like me and my buddy Rod Manley. Uh, if you're, I I don't even I haven't talked to him in 20 years, but me and my buddy Rod Manley were at the show, and REM opened and. The entire Red Rocks was literally booing REM. Like they didn't, they, uh, they wanted to see the English oh, wow. beat and they were booing REM. I was saying that's funny. Like today, yeah. I've, I've never seen a band boot. It does <laughs> yeah, not right? happen. Band it doesn't does seem like it. But, but then it, it happened. And me and Rod were just like, why is everybody booing? Like these guys are, these guys are like legit. They're, they're pretty awesome. It was before they had any, you know, hits or anything. Now, Jordan, you have a, a good story about uh, one of those uh, unpopular bands well, before my, they were popular. I'm more, I'm a lot more into the underground stuff, so it's it's harder to come by these, you know, like these ones that are opening for a larger band that become big because usually a band that's gonna be big is gonna be touring with like a big big band, and that's how they get popular. But so it's almost more interesting when you find a band that becomes big for opening up for like these, you know, a smaller smaller band. acts. And so, uh, Fun was one of them, opening for Manchester Orchestra. I saw them in like a hundred, you know, hundred crowd max uh, venue. Um, and then a, uh, what's the other one called? Portugal. Portugal the Man. Portugal the Man opening for Me Without You all the time. They, they, they toured with them all the time. They've, 
they didn't get big until their tenth album. They came with an album every single year, and then all of a sudden they blew up on like their tenth album, which is kind of funny. So Nick, uh, can you remember seeing in concert like a band that was at the time nobody even thought about, and then they ended up being like a, a I don't, major success? I don't think I have any. Oh. I don't know if I have any. I mean, I saw like Dave Matthews Band before he was, but I don't. I, I think he was still opening, but it was a smaller venue. Well, that's I don't pretty know good. That's a pretty good one right there. That's pretty good. Yeah, one. my brother was really into Dave Matthews, so I remember going really early on. I think before he really kind of took off. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, I was that time, man. I was really into reggae, so I was seeing a lot of reggae sure, bands. Sure. Yeah. Right. And they're definitely. They're definitely a lot more underground um, reggae bands. Speaking of reggae, did, w- you, did you get into ska, yeah. did you get into ska at all? Were you like a ska guy at all? Totally, man. That's yes. what kind of started. Um, a friend of mine made a mixtape called Mix Number One, and it was all old ska and rock steady music, and that's right. pretty much what got me into you know reggae and um, Scatolites are one. Yeah. Toots and the Maytals. Yeah. Toots and the Maytals. If you never have Maytals. you heard of Toots and the Maytals? Of course, yeah. Toots is like he's like the Jamaican James Brown, man. That guy is still going and he's got an incredible voice and the concerts were always he used to let us on stage and we used to dance with them and uh, always just upful. You know, Nick, really here's here, here's an interesting one for you. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but so like you're, I I know you're familiar with like the Specials and Madness and the Selector and all those two tone bands, right? Well, Selecta. exactly. Like, but what most people don't realize is almost all of those songs came from a guy named Prince Buster. Are you familiar with Prince Buster? Prince Buster. Yeah, man. Yeah, yes, I. I mean, he was like like Prince late nineteen sixties, you know, and like all those songs, like That's gangsters. Where all that comes from all those yes. songs. There's covers like gangsters, like actually came from a song called Al Capone from Prince Buster. Like all of those songs, yes. almost all of those songs Classics. came from a guy named Prince Buster. And and literally like yes. that started like the whole entire ska movement is incredible. So if we had to go uh, first wave, second wave versus third wave ska, what do we go? Oh, second. Uh, no, first wave. You got. I you, got second wave. No, two I tone mean, roots. That's the foundation. We call that the foundation. <laughs> yeah. That's the foundation. You must know the foundation. They, who is the guy? That all late sixties man. Scatolites. You got to check yeah. out. Yeah, right. Like that Prince Buster. Yeah. Prince Jammy. Uh, King Tubby. All of that original like dub music is where all of the dance music and like electronic music and they even say hip hop came from. Like the original right. dub music from Jamaica, they started making the instrumental tracks on the backside of the vinyl, and they would just play the instrumental, and then the the uh, DJs would call it toasting, where they would get right. the crowd going and they talk over the instrumental, and they started like sort of getting into their own rhymes. Right, and then a lot of that dub music was drum and bass with the reverb. A lot of like the the dance music, electronic music, all, you know, they all took from that that original music. And one of the one, to cut you off. one of the guys from the specials, I can't think of his name right off the top of my head, but he started Two Tone Records, and like he remember there was a movie called Dance Craze, and like that movie, like mm. boom, like ska like blew up after that movie like you had the specials yeah. body snatchers selector madness body english snatchers. Beat, like all those guys yes. man that was like an incredible time in music man it was so different and unique yeah. loved it yeah all yeah. right so let's all get all influence oh, yeah man yeah. <laughs> let's get to our you weekly top three up. jordan you can do the weekly top three song now how about this sing. one Weekly top three. <laughs> so this week's weekly top three is the top three music videos of all time. And none of mine are ska. Not really. None of mine are ska. Rude. Jordan, uh, let's start with you. What are your top three music videos of all time? And if you're Ooh. watching on Facebook right now, I want to hear what you guys think. Your favorite like music now, videos that still stick in your head. I feel like you took some of the good ones. Okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna go again. You know, the first like good three I found, I remember. Okay, go here it goes again. Was like that was like the origin of like the social 
you know, like the the uh, viral video sort of. Ah, and that was it was a music video viral video. Um, uh, I'll go with uh, Kanye West can't tell me nothing because Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like goodness, how do you do that? Uh, yeah. And then Weird Al, Amish Paradise. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Get out of here, Amish Paradise. That is, a, I almost picked a Weird Al video, he but I some of the good ones. I went with as as Nick's thinking of his three. I went with uh, Beastie Boys Sabotage. Ooh. I mean, that is. Oh, now, on. I'll, come on. Now, that's also, my, there, my. there is on. a like thirty-minute sequel to that on YouTube that you all need to look up because it's like a, it's like awesome. Like Will Ferrell, <laughs> and like all these comedians are like playing the Beastie Boys. It's amazing. Yeah, that's that's a great video. Uh, my second one is. Um, the Happy Days version <laughs> of uh, yes. Buddy Holly by Weezer. Like, yes. that video is still to this day, like, etched in my memory. How did they do that at the time? It was, but that was good. The first video that, like, kicked off, like, amazing videos, like, taking it to a whole nother level was Aha, Take On Me. Yep. You know, with the, the sketches? Ooh. Like, that was, okay, like, now I think of that video, uh, the song, and you know, it's kind of cheesy or whatever, but at the time, like, that video was just, like, mind-bogglingly awesome. It was like, how could they possibly have made this video? It's so freaking cool. It's pretty cool even today. It is pretty cool. All right, so, Nick, what are your top three music videos of all time? Besides your own, of course, because the uh, the Reminders Foundation is probably the best. But other than that. I was going to say that when You took two of mine. <laughs> um, so... I'm going to say, uh, can I say Subterranean Homesick Blues, Bob Dylan? Oh, I mean, you can say Ooh. whatever you want. That's amazing. All right, Bob Dylan. Have you seen that video? I love you know Bob one? Dylan. I don't he's know that video. Say, yeah. Oh, come on. That's one of the, the uh, classics. That's when he's holding up the, the oh, signs. Of course. Yeah, and the lyrics are spinning. How yeah. many times has that been spoofed? Cr- I mean, gosh, that's like Oh, right, iconic. right, right, right. Didn't Weird Al do one of those? Uh, I think he Weird had Al to have. Some, everyone's yeah. done it. Um. I'm going to say um, Smells Like Teen Spirit, Nirvana. Oh, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. come on. That's a classic. And, and Weird, Al, Weird Al did do yeah, that yeah. one. That was a good one, too. <laughs> um, I'm going to say for my last one, a pro- very profound video, kind of appropriate for the times, uh, this is America, Childish Gambino. Right, right. That's right. a famous that, that, That's a Yeah, famous that video. one was pretty powerful. Yeah, no doubt about that. No, that's good. Like so, yeah. so like music videos. I can remember, like back in the day, like MTV, when they when they they, they were actually playing videos at the time. They played like a split. What happened? They played music like a they played MTV. like a split in what song. What the hell happened? They played Turning Japanese. Well, they played, even like the shows that weren't, you know, like there were show, like Beavis and Butthead still played music videos on the yeah. show. They rocked the Casbah. They, they like it. they they played like these videos and it was like man it was just like so amazing like the fact that we could watch like videos of music videos it was so cool i don't think mtv even plays do they play videos anymore i don't even know it's almost weird that there still is music videos it's just done as like uh right check this out like (laughs) i haven't seen it can we do honorable mentions yes yeah let's hear some a lot okay sir mix a lot baby's got back Oh, ah. how about um? How about um? <laughs> how, what's the one grizzly bear one where their heads are on uh, fire? That one's amazing. What's the song, Dominic? Oh, you know you're talking about um, two weeks, um, two weeks, right? two weeks. It's gotta be. That's a great video, man. No, That's wait. incredible. Is that the one? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that one's called Two Weeks. Oh, I thought I so. I was thinking of another. What were? There's some good stuff, man. I mean. You know, like, there's a time in your life when music is, like, so, like, important to you. And now, Nick, I'm 50, I'm almost 55, and, like, music... Oh, you're young. Music's sort of, like, coming back to me. Like, I'm, like, Whoa, so into... Nice. I'm so, like, so into it again. It's, it's like it's like a rebirth of of music again for That's me. That's great. Like, you know, revisiting But my, what he means by that is he's just re-listening to all the yes. old, old stuff that he listened to before. Like, What are you listening you're to? You're not what's, discovering what's new stuff. That? XTC, baby. Oh, uh, I love XTC. them. If XTC. you come into the Dojo okay. Studios, we listen to New Wave, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's pretty much new it. Wave, New yeah. Wave. I listen to the like, Clash. Yeah. I listen to, you know, yes. Blur, uh, Oasis, you know, XTC, and all that kind of stuff. Like that's that's my yeah. jam, man. Oasis. But the Oasis specials got some classics. No, Nick. To me, the specials wait. are still the number one. Number one. Nick, do you go do you, Oasis do you, versus Blur? Who do you go? 
Oh, man. I have to say Oasis, man. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you should revisit Blur. I don't know. I, I don't think know. You Blur? Re- All right. I'll check them out. Revisit I don't think Blur. I, I know much Blur, to be honest. So Yo, here's I the thing. You I know do. more than you think. Nick. I swear. Like, like you will be like, Give me oh, one. Give me one. Them? How about, well, obviously, everybody knows Song 2, right? Like, that's the thing. Woohoo! Right? That one? You know the song? Yeah, yeah. But like Blur yeah. is like loaded. Like the woohoo they, gave it away. Yeah, their 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 <laughs> their whole repertoire. It's amazing. Like if you just go back and no, like listen deep. to yeah, it, it's, deep. it's super deep. And you can really sense like the gorillas coming out of that. You know the gorillas. Like you can see how yeah, like the gorillas. gorillas came out of Blur. Like it's towards the end of Blur. It's essentially the gorillas. Mm-hmm. It really is. Eric, yes. check out punk. Punky Reggae Party oh, by Bob Marley. Yes. I, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge Bob Marley fan. So, yeah. But that whole song is about all the music you're talking about. The Clash, uh, Maytals, all those guys. He's singing about punks and the reggae community in England coming together. That's awesome. Because they were, like, both seen as outcasts by the society. So, like, you know, the dreads, everybody kind of, you know... The kind of English society feared them, and then they feared like the whole punk community. So have you they all kind have of you ever started to unite? Have you ever listened from start to finish uh, "Sandinista" by The Clash? Oh come on, yeah, of course. Uh, that's Being really in Nicaragua. I that, had to yeah. now. Now that Nick <laughs> yeah. is super it's research, inter- baby. That's super interesting, right? Because yeah. like that actually has some ties to cigars in a way, like that. That whole time, and by the way, totally, that was a three album set. At Who the does time. that? A three album. It was a three album Goodness. set, and was, I got, I gotta say, like, just wait. I'm one of the biggest Clash fans in the world. But that uh, that set yes. could have been edited down to two. Like, there's oh. at least nine tracks that probably shouldn't have made it. That's just my opinion. So a two, double. So up. wait a second. Is that the, is that the album that? Um, who produced that album? Do you remember? I do not know. I think somebody from I gotta look this up now because I think it was um, I think it was a reggae producer that produced it. There's a if lot. I there's think a lot of reggae with them. style they, tracks on that on that album. Yeah, yeah, they worked with um, they might might have worked with Prince Buster on that or something. Oh, that would be or it was incredible. Or they worked with um, Lee Scratch Perry. I might be might be off now. I'm so producer Mikey Dread. Yeah. There you go. Mikey Dread. Yeah. That's but an I interesting one. I, I when I recently flew to Miami like b- b- right before corona hit, I right. just I just listened to it back to front front to back both ways and it's a great album. I mean it's a great compilation, but it's a little long. I mean it, you know, yeah. like London Calling was probably a better you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was a it was a better edited Sorry. down yeah. version of an of a of a release, but Sandinista is fun because there's some really interesting tracks on there. Really bizarre, like like you would never even expect that well, they would be. That's the problem with some of these bands that go on too long. Like I saw the Gorillas at Red Rocks last year, and like he's, it's like uh, if you ever seen like Dewey Cox, like at the end of the movie, he's just like, I need an army of didgeridoos, <laughs> and like the Gorillas is like the same thing. Like he's into like African music, and he has like an army of like African uh, type instruments out on the stage, and it's like. This is not what I came to the show for, but <laughs> <laughs> Guns of Brixton. Oh, oh that yeah. song's ridiculous. Come on, man. man. There's some no, oh, there's some classic tunes on San Denisa. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's amazing. It's just maybe could have been edited. That's all I'm saying. Could have been edited slightly. There was somebody did not so recently um a documentary on the clash and the breakup or when they were going through turmoil there and I didn't finish. Uh, I don't know much of, about it. But well, both Joe Strummer and Mick Jones went on to do great stuff. Wasn't like, one of them in the right. Gorillas? Yeah, Mick right. Jones. Mick Jones played in the Gorillas. Oh, he was. Yeah, uh. he played in the Gorillas for like a, a whole summer or something. And then <laughs> Joe Strummer had his, you know, he had a, a solo career, which he had some really great stuff. But yeah, I mean, come on, the Clash, obviously, you know, that's next level kind of stuff for me. Anyways, all yeah. right. So, hey guys, uh, Nick, I just got to thank you so much for taking the time on a Friday night to join us for Smoke Night Live. Guys, this has been an fun. amazing hour and fifteen minutes. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you. 
This is uh, always a pleasure to be on here. Hopefully, uh, we can do this in person, maybe this summer. Yeah, Sometime. we'd love. We'd, if there is no Rocky Mountain Cigar, if we Fest, get you out here, you're the headlining act. Oh yeah, we'll you know, have, we get a bunch of dojo guys out here. It'll be amazing. We already have wow. like commitments from amazing. tons of dojo people. They're coming anyways. They don't care whether the show happens or not. Yeah. It's gonna happen. We're gonna All have, right. have a dojo party one way or another. We'll have a studio show. It'll be a blast, uh, folks. Um, Wednesday, June tenth. Uh, Flavor Odyssey returns with Robbie and Randy, and they will be... Oh, by the way, Nick, don't go away. I have to talk to you about something after the show. It's very important. Very, yes, sir. Yes, very sir. important, so don't go away. Don't you do it, Nick. But uh, Flavor Odyssey returns uh, Wednesday, June 10th. That's this coming Wednesday. They will be pairing... Robbie and Randy will be pairing this Sober Mesa Brulee with coffee and cream. So that's the pairing. Delicious. Last last week we did the numero uno with a Chardonnay, and the week before that we did a Perdomo with a Moscow Mule. So we're Nick, we're exploring the Connecticut Shade wrapper with different pairings, and so this week it is Sober Mesa Brulee with coffee and cream. Guys, here's the big one. Now I can't tell you everything about next week's show, but I can tell you that next Friday night on Smoke Night Live, Pedro Gomez. From Drew Estate will be on the show, and there's hey, going to, uh, there is going to be an announcement on that show that is going to blow everybody's minds. As Jack Black would say, it'll Sweet. blow the classical cigars out your butt. It, it is going to be amazing. It is literally going to be probably the biggest show of the year because of what will be announced on the show. So make sure to tune in next Friday night for Smoke Night Live. It's going to be awesome. Until next week, remember, never never smoke smoke alone. alone. Smoke alone. There we go.